I am cautiously optimistic uh, about uh, Afghanistan's future. Afghanistan is a country which has gone through 30 years of disastrous conflict, which has destroyed infrastructure, it's destroyed institutions, and it will take uh, decades uh, to recover uh, from the destruction that was wrought over that period of time. We have uh, with us for our first members lecture this year, Sir Simon Gass, the NATO senior civilian representative in Afghanistan. Um, it's a particular pleasure for me to welcome Simon. We were colleagues together in security policy department of the Foreign Office in those happy days of the Cold War when things were so much easier. Um, and we were reminiscing about um, several of the um, disasters for which we were responsible um, at that time. Um, since then, Simon's uh, career um, has uh, involved him in two of the fun places for British diplomacy. Um, he was uh, ambassador in Tehran, um, having previously served as deputy high commissioner in um, South Africa and ambassador in Greece. And since last year, um, he has been in Kabul in his um, present job uh, with NATO. Afghanistan, you don't need me to say, is the focal point of British security. And we are very lucky to have with us today to talk on the subject um, of Afghanistan and the international community, transition and beyond, one of the key officials responsible. Simon will speak for around 20 minutes or so. His address will be on the record. The question and answer session afterwards will be off the record. Simon, thanks so much for coming. Uh, well, Paul, ladies and gentlemen, can I first say it's a great pleasure to be here uh, at VUSI uh, and uh, an even greater privilege to be introduced by Paul Lever. Uh, as Paul said, uh, I've uh, been lucky enough to work for Paul on two previous occasions uh, in my career, and he was really one of the people from whom I learned uh, so much about uh, diplomacy and how to do it. I'm only sorry that I let you down, Paul, by heading eastwards when I'm sure you would have preferred that I stayed in the security sector or at least in, 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 in Europe. Uh, today's uh, uh, talk, I think, comes at a, an interesting time because here we are at the beginning of January uh, 2012, only 36 months, only 36 months uh, until the Afghan National Security Forces take full responsibility uh, for security across Afghanistan, and ISAF's mission comes to a close. And the way in which we, the international community, and our Afghan partners use those 36 months will, I think, be very important to determining the degree of stability which we are all trying to work for in Afghanistan. And therefore, today, I thought it was a good moment to reflect a little bit on the progress which we have made so far, uh, and what more we can do. And I'll be focusing particularly uh, in a security sense, not least in deference to the institution in which I make my uh, speech, but I will refer to some of the other uh, challenges, and there are certainly issues which we can explore more in discussion afterwards. You know, I often think that uh, the degree to which you believe or do not believe that we have made headway in Afghanistan depends very much on your starting point. Uh, if your starting point is the uh, years uh, immediately after 2001, uh, when uh, ambition was very high, the insurgency seemed to have been uh, stamped out, uh, then uh, you would say that the progress we have made since then has not been as great as uh, we would have liked or indeed expected. But I'd also like to take you back to a different uh, measuring uh, point, which would be mid-2009. Uh, in mid-2009, uh, General Stan McChrystal uh, signed off his famous report uh, on the situation uh, in Afghanistan. He signed it off, I think, on the 30th of August, 2009. 
And at that point, he was talking about mission failure. Uh, if the campaign uh, was not scaled uh, to match the task uh, in front of him, uh, he believed that the campaign could be lost. And that wasn't that surprising, because when you look back at mid-2009, we were in a position in which substantial parts of the country, uh, uh, the insurgents had freedom of movement and quite a degree of control. Uh, officers that I've spoken to who were uh, in some of the more violent parts of Afghanistan at the time tell me of uh, days of continuous and substantial attacks uh, on our outposts. Of course, McChrystal didn't just look at the security uh, uh, environment, but he also warned of some of the weaknesses in the state of Afghanistan, uh, corruption, narcotics, weak institutions, power brokers, weak links between uh, uh, the governors and the governed, and also uh, an Afghan national security force which was inadequate both in terms of numbers, equipment, training, you name it. So the picture in mid-2009 was a very bleak one. So if we roll forward some 28 months after the McChrystal report, I think it would be fair to say that the uh, outlook in Afghanistan does look quite different. The surge in forces through 2010 and 2011 uh, allowed two major achievements in security. The first is that the insurgency has been rolled back uh, in some important parts of the country, including the Taliban heartlands of Helmand and Kandahar. Of course, as ISAF, with its Afghan partners, pushed into many of those uh, contested areas, uh, the violence uh, did grow. That was uh, inevitable. But uh, what we are seeing now is that in uh, areas like central Helmand, uh, the number of enemy attacks in 2011 compared with 2010 uh, is down 30% in Helmand. If you look at the central districts of, of, of Helmand, uh, you see a much steeper fall. And that is because uh, the uh, international and Afghan forces have got a much better grip uh, on security in those Pashtun heartlands. Uh, Kandahar is still uh, uh, contested, but undoubtedly uh, the insurgency is on the back foot, and we see clear evidence of insurgents finding it more difficult to resupply, more difficult to uh, recruit, more difficult to persuade their commanders to come back from uh, Pakistan, uh, particularly in the south and the southwest of the country. The second um, security achievement, of course, has been the quite remarkable project to train and equip the Afghan army and police. This is a program which isn't yet complete, of course. Uh, it will continue for a long time to come. But we are now seeing uh, the effects of this. And those effects are not simply in terms of numbers, where we now have uh, an Afghan army and police force of about 320,000 having been through training. But we're also seeing substantial improvements in the quality and capability of the Afghan security force forces. Now in theatre, about 95% of all operations are partnered between Afghan and ISAF forces. And we are seeing more and more of those operations actually being led by Afghan forces. Uh, the figure is now over 35% of operations in theatre being led by the Afghan security forces. We're seeing the Afghan army running uh, coordinated brigade-level operations in places like Helmand uh, and Kandahar, coordinated with the Afghan police, coordinated with the local authorities, uh, uh, and that is proving rather effective. We had uh, quite a good example, in fact, um, a few weeks ago, where in Badakhshan, in the northeast of the country, um, insurgents kidnapped uh, a number of people. Uh, two battalions of the Afghan army mobilized in extremely adverse, wintry, snowy uh, conditions uh, and conducted really a, a rather impressive operation which resulted in freeing of the hostages and pursuit uh, of the insurgents. So we are seeing not only quantitative improvements in the Afghan security forces, we are also now beginning to see that qualitative improvement in terms of stepping forward and leading the fight which we have wanted to see. 
As I said, just a, a note of caution, this is not a complete process. There is still a long way to go, but the direction of travel uh, is, the right, uh, is the right direction. 70% of all training is now conducted actually by the Afghans themselves rather than foreign trainers. So all of this um, is giving us confidence uh, in the ability of our Afghan partners to progressively take over the responsibility for security uh, in Afghanistan, and that transition process will continue as set out in the Lisbon strategy up until the end of 2014. Now, I don't want um, to paint a, 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 an uncritical picture or, or, or an over-rosy picture. Of course, security is still a major problem uh, in Afghanistan, whether it is uh, security uh, of the armed forces or whether it's security of civilians. We still have uh, unacceptably high levels of civilian casualties, the vast majority of them, of course, uh, caused by insurgent uh, roadside bombs and suicide uh, bombs. Nevertheless, it is um, interesting that in a recent um, survey, which is probably one of the most authoritative um, uh, surveys on Afghanistan, the Asia Foundation survey, which has been conducted surveys over a number of years, I found it very interesting that uh, when um, those polled were asked what was Afghanistan's biggest problem, the answer was clearly security, 38%. But when you ask people what their local problems were, security came in sixth in order, behind what you might expect, jobs, roads, water, electricity. And I think that that is a modest uh, sign of growing normality uh, in Afghanistan, more and more people worrying more about the day-to-day -day challenges that they face. Uh, security is still undoubtedly a, a significant problem, uh, but one where I think we have achieved some improvements. I mentioned transition earlier. Um, uh, I said that we have begun now the process of handing over security responsibility progressively uh, through Afghanistan to the Afghan security forces. The first tranche of uh, areas uh, was announced in uh, July, and in November President Karzai announced the second uh, series of provinces and districts uh, in which Afghan security forces will begin to take uh, control. And now, uh, or at least by the end of this month, uh, about 50% of all Afghans will live in areas which are transitioning into ANSF responsibility. And I think that that is uh, a significant success. So far we have not seen uh, a deterioration of security uh, in those areas, which is um, out of proportion to the geographical parts of the country which they uh, are part of. Now, of course, there are still a lot of variables in terms of uh, how the campaign will turn out. One, of course, is the insurgency itself. Uh, 2011 was not a good year for the insurgents. Uh, they announced uh, before the summer that their El Badr campaign was going to retake control of uh, areas of the Pashtun heartlands, again, Helmand, Kandahar in particular, and in that they conspicuously failed. There were many other threats. They threatened to disrupt the lawyer Jirga, which met uh, recently to uh, consider uh, the peace process and relations with the United States. They failed. It was an extremely good security operation run by the Afghans, uh, which foiled attempts to disrupt it. Uh, that does not mean, of course, that the insurgents um, are down and out in any way. They are a resilient uh, and vigorous uh, enemy. But what I would say is that the momentum which they had built up a couple of years ago is no longer there. The picture is different in different parts of the country. And again, some of you may say to me that the position in the east of Afghanistan is not so good. That is certainly true. There is more work to be done uh, particularly uh, in the East, but that work, I think, will be done, uh, and uh, I trust that we will continue to see the uh, insurgents on the back foot. Another element which has been in the press a good deal uh, over the last few weeks uh, is the possibility of some form of reconciliation process, a form of political process, and we all believe that that, that is a necessary component of long-term success because that is how insurgencies tend to end. They don't tend to end with a, a, a military knockout blow. Um, we will see whether the signs that the Taliban uh, are open to uh, opening an office in Ghattar uh, comes to fruit and whether 
it leads to a wider dialogue about peace. If it does so, there are two key conditions which need to be met in order for it to be successful. The first is that it does have to be an Afghan-led process. Any reconciliation process needs to be led by Afghans and owned by the different ethnic groups uh, which make up the country. Foreigners can support that process, they can lay the groundwork for that process, but if peace talks are to be successful, they need to be Afghan to Afghan. Secondly, the insurgents will have to meet the key criteria laid down by the government of Afghanistan in terms of ending violence, breaking links with um, uh, al-Qaeda, but also, critically, uh, respect for the Afghan constitution, the Afghan constitution, of course, being the uh, uh, document which enshrines many of the human rights uh, which we all support and which so many Afghans do not want to be traded away. Linked to, to that issue, of course, there is Pakistan. Uh, what role will Pakistan play as this process uh, moves forward? I'm sure a number of you follow uh, relations with that country uh, well. Uh, the question is, can we um, persuade Pakistan to do what it can to turn up the heat on the insurgents, to encourage the insurgents to come to the table uh, and seek peace? Uh, that is an issue which uh, remains to be seen. A second major vari uh, variable is the international community itself, I mean us, in other words. We have all made a huge investment in Afghanistan. Beyond 2014, the sums of money which will be needed will be very much smaller than they are today. But it is clear that if Afghanistan is to be successful in the longer term, there does need to be a strong long-term partnership uh, between the international community and Afghanistan. We will need for some years to fund the Afghan security forces and to support it through continued uh, training and uh, possibly other forms of support. And our countries will also need to provide Afghanistan with generous development assistance. Of course, we should never forget that Afghanistan is not only a country which is uh, afflicted by 30 years of conflict, uh, but it is also one of the poorest countries on earth uh, and therefore needs continuing support. Uh, as we move through to the May NATO summit and uh, the July uh, meeting in Tokyo, which will look at economic development, I expect to see the commitments of the international community uh, become more solid. Now, of course, the challenges of that are clear. We all understand the economic positions which our countries face. Nevertheless, I am cautiously optimistic that we will be able to achieve that funded long-term partnership which Afghanistan will need. The first reason is that I don't think that our governments will want to put at risk uh, the huge investment of lives and money which they have made in Afghanistan, particularly because the sums of money required will be so much smaller uh, than the cost of today's military campaign and development uh, assistance and so forth. Uh, in addition, of course, as I mentioned, Afghanistan is an extremely poor country and would, under any circumstances, uh, be eligible for substantial uh, amounts of uh, development assistance, irrespective uh, of the insurgency. Thirdly, were Afghanistan to sink back into chaos, which I do not predict, but were that to be the case, then the cost to our governments of increased flows of narcotics and refugees, not to mention uh, the consequent instability in one of the most sensitive parts of the world uh, would be very costly uh, for all of us and therefore uh, I am pretty confident that we will achieve the sorts of commitments which the international community has already said uh, that it will meet. A third variable in uh, the way forward is the government of Afghanistan itself of course. If the international community is to make a major investment in Afghanistan in the future then it is only fair to ask President Karzai's government itself uh, to take the steps which are needed to make that investment productive and lasting. This is a process, of course, which has been going on for uh, a number of years, but we still need to see further movement forward in areas like governance, in terms of combating corruption, in areas such as the economy, uh, in order uh, to ensure that the uh, chances of a stable future are maximised. 
Uh, part of that will be to ensure that the presidential elections, which are due in 2014, uh, are not only fair, but are also seen to be fair and therefore owned uh, by all Afghans. I also hope to see early agreement on a US-Afghanistan strategic partnership, uh, since I believe that that will be the cornerstone of Afghans' future uh, security stability. All of this will involve some tough decisions for our Afghan partners as well as for the international community, uh, but they are necessary if we are to form that long-term partnership which is essential to the continuing sustainment uh, of Afghanistan. Uh, to conclude, uh, I am cautiously optimistic uh, about uh, Afghanistan's future. Uh, future. Uh, it will not quickly become the sort of model state which perhaps we hoped for um, uh, some years ago. But I'm not sure that that was really realistic. Afghanistan is a country which has gone through 30 years of disastrous conflict, which has destroyed infrastructure, it's destroyed institutions, and it will take uh, decades uh, to recover uh, from the destruction that was wrought over that period of time. And if we look, uh, for example, at um, uh, the World Bank's World Development Report for 2011, we see that countries coming out of prolonged conflict do not have strong institutions um, uh, pushing back corruption uh, and democratic values, rule of law and so forth. Those are not uh, values which can be delivered within short periods of time. Typically they take 30 years or so in countries coming out of uh, conflict. So we should not, I think, judge Afghanistan against standards uh, which uh, are not uh, uh, what we expect uh, from many of Afghanistan's neighbours. Nevertheless, we should be ambitious. For example, Afghanistan still does have human rights challenges, including uh, the way in which women are uh, sometimes treated in Afghanistan, uh, which need to be addressed vigorously. My hope for Afghanistan is that uh, at the end of 2014 we will leave uh, a security platform which is stable enough for the country to be able to manage an insurgency if it still exists at that point without it representing uh, an existential threat uh, to the government of Afghanistan. And also that we will have agreed on the sort of long-term partnership which I have talked about which I believe is necessary for uh, the future stability of the country. Of course, uh, there will be many risks and challenges uh, ahead. But increasingly, I think that those challenges will be the sorts of challenges which are faced by a country uh, of Afghanistan's uh, level of development, uh, its geographical situation, and its history of conflict. As Afghans take increasing responsibility for their own future, as they wish to do and as they must, we will at times find that the choices they make are not the choices we would want them to make. That is what independence and taking responsibility uh, is all about. And that really is our goal, to allow Afghans to once more be in a position where they can take responsibility for their own future in their own hands. Thank you very much.